There's a whole lot of different skulls out there, and they come in a crazy variety of shapes and sizes. Now, a lot of this variation exists because different skulls have evolved through natural selection to be better at doing different things. So what about the skulls of animals that tend to be able to bite harder than other animals? Do they share anything in common? Well, yes, it turns out they often do. In this video, we're going to be looking at skull adaptations for delivering crushing bites. And I'll finish up with an extreme example that just happens to be one of my favorite skulls of any animal that's around today. I'm Dr. Rex, welcome to the Scully Wag Lab, where I present the bare bones fundamentals of skull science. So biting hard isn't necessarily just about being able to generate high bite forces, but the skull also has to be able to withstand those forces as well. So let's take a look at how the skulls of different animals have become adapted to be able to do this. In a previous video, I showed how changing the sizes of different parts of a lever can change the amount of muscle force that can be converted to bite force. With this in mind, there's three main ways to increase the amount of force generated at a biting tooth. The most obvious way is to increase how hard the muscles can bite, which means the jaw muscles need to get bigger. Increasing the amount of muscle that a skull can support tends to involve a widening of the skull. This often relates to the fact that the temporalis muscles run behind the cheekbones to attach to the jawbone, and so the cheekbones need to be wider to make more space for them to thicken up behind the bone when flexing. The other two ways to adapt the skull to increase bite forces involve increasing the mechanical efficiency, otherwise known as leverage. The first way would be to increase the length of the in-lever. This extends the location of where the muscles attach forward bringing them closer to the biting teeth. Think about when you grab barbecue tongs close to the joint, you can't really generate a lot of force here, but when you grab closer to the tips, you can really do some damage. It's the same principle. The other way is to decrease the length of the out lever by shortening the face. This brings the biting teeth further backwards and closer to the biting muscles. Now it's all well and good to be able to bite harder, but the skull needs to be able to support harder bites as well. This is because as the bone transmits muscle forces to the biting tooth, some stress spreads throughout the bone as well. This stress causes bending of the bone. Too much bending can lead to injuries, including breakage. Increasing the amount of bone in the skull can add more space for the stress to disperse. Animals that bite hard therefore tend to also have deeper skulls or have thicker bone in places where stress is highest during biting. The same thing often applies to the teeth, which are often larger in animals that tend to bite harder into more resistant foods. And this is because larger teeth are more resistant to breakage than smaller teeth. These kinds of things are easiest to point out if we compare species that are a little bit more closely related. For example, we could compare the skulls of an elephant and a giraffe, which are really different in their features and proportions but there's so many other things going on there that adaptation specifically for harder biting can be a little bit more difficult to point out. The same thing applies to humans. Our gigantic brains sitting on top of our tiny little faces are so different to the skulls of our closest relatives around today that it's harder to point out these patterns in comparisons. There's certainly things to say about it, but that's for a later video. We also can't really apply these patterns to domesticated breeds of dogs or cats or anything because these breeds have been created by humans for various reasons rather than just for their ability to bite in nature. So I've decided to compare and contrast species that don't bite so hard with species that can bite quite a bit harder across three families of the carnivora. Let's start with the bears. Now, a grizzly bear can certainly bite pretty hard, but most of this comes from the fact that a grizzly bear and its skull is so big to begin with. And obviously bigger animals can bite harder than smaller animals. So this doesn't require a huge amount of hard biting adaptation. Brown bears are omnivorous, eating parts of both plants and animals. And both meat and plant parts like berries are actually pretty easy for a large animal to slice and tear up. Some of the highest forces a grizzly bear skull would have to deal with would instead happen during capturing of larger prey. But keep in mind these prey are often overwhelmed with the help of the bear's superior strength and heavy body. It's your funeral, man. Now in contrast, let's take a look at one of nature's kings of crushing food, the giant panda. Pandas spend most of their lives tearing apart and crushing thick, tough, resistant bamboo. So their skulls are an awesome example of all these hard biting adaptations I mentioned. You can see, compared to the grizzly, they have a shorter face and a deeper skull, but also an extremely wide skull for giant jaw muscles and also much larger teeth, which are positioned further back for greater leverage. All this generates an insane amount of crushing power, 
with an estimated 1,600 newtons of force at the molars, compared to an estimated 620 newtons for the grizzly bear. Now let's look at the hog badger. These guys spend their days sniffing around in the topsoil, looking for small, soft animals like earthworms and beetle larvae. In general, the hardest foods they might have a go at eating would be like a tougher beetle shell or an acorn or something. In comparison, check out the skull of this sea otter. As you can see, much shorter and deeper face, wider cheekbones for larger muscles, and yes, extremely large teeth. This aligns with their diet dominated by various shellfish like sea urchins and mussels. Dr. Chris Law from the University of Washington and co-authors also just published this cool work on tool use in sea otters. They showed that using tools to crack open the hardest shellfish can both save otters from breaking their teeth and also give them access to even more foods like larger mussels and crabs that would ordinarily be too hard to bite into. Really cool stuff. Next, let's look at the aardwolf. By all accounts, it looks like a skinny hyena, and that's because they're pretty closely related. But the aardwolf doesn't eat anything even close to what hyenas do. It eats insects, mostly termites. So it has quite a lean looking skull. Now compare this to the skull of the spotted hyena. They have shorter, deeper skulls that are also much wider to help them crack into bones of large prey and get to that nutritious marrow. Also, look at the difference in the cheek teeth. The aardwolf has all but lost theirs, while the hyenas are bloody huge. Now this video wouldn't be anywhere near as cool without showing some extreme examples. So let's start with a skull of an animal that has pretty much no capacity for biting at all, let alone hard biting. The giant anteater. This skull is basically a tube. It has no teeth and doesn't just have a skinnier skull at the cheekbones, it's lost them all together. Now people often think their skull is long like this to stick it all the way into ants nests and termite mounds. But in reality, the structure of these nests doesn't really allow for big long noses like this to go all the way in. Instead, the skull is this long to house a ridiculously long tongue at about 2 feet or 60 centimeters. And they inject this into the nest to slurp up mouthfuls of ants and termites. Delicious. Now, let's take a look at the other extreme. And this is one of my favorite skulls around today. Would you have a look at this guy? It's maxed out all of the adaptations I mentioned. Its face is so short and deep that it almost doesn't have a face at all. But you can see it does indeed have a face, complete with an adorable row of tiny front teeth. That's right, this skull belongs to the wrinkle face bat. And as you can see, it's also super wide with simply huge cheek teeth. This species eats fruit, which you would think would be soft. And it usually is, but it's generally thought that this soft ripe fruit isn't hanging around at all times of the year. And so these bats sometimes need to eat those less ripe fruits, which can be really tough. They're also known to eat seeds, which tend to be harder than most ripe fruits. But a lot of this excess adaptation going on here is probably also to do with their small size, meaning they need to bite harder than a larger bat would to access foods of the same hardness. Kind of like the reverse of a grizzly bear. That being said, I'm planning an upcoming video that dives deeper into how the size of an animal influences its skull shape and biting ability. So I hope you enjoyed this short introduction to adaptations to delivering those crushing bites, and you got to see some really cool skulls as well. Catch you in the next video.